Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 23rd of June 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is the new DLC for Beat Hazard, Beat Hazard Ultra, which, as you can probably tell, makes the game a lot harder, but also a hell of a lot more awesome. Fair warning, those of you who may experience discomfort or major seizures or whatever from watching a lot of flashing lights may wish to minimize this window and simply listen to it, although this video is recorded at 30 frames per second, so it shouldn't be causing any fits. Those of you who were not paying attention and are wondering why there has not been a mailbox in the past week, that's because I have been at DreamHack in Sweden, and I've only just come back. Needless to say, I had no time to produce any other videos, aside from the StarCraft stuff that I was casting about 14 hours a day. Okay, folks, let's kick it off right here with an email from Tigran. It says, Recently I've noticed a wave of PC gamers who have a sudden hatred for console games and consoles in general. When reading discussions about games like Battlefield 3 and Dust 514 on YouTube, I'm seeing many PC gamers claiming that nobody cares about consoles and why get a console when you can use a PC, often with far more malice in uppercase letters. Although yes, the PC is a more powerful console on a regular basis, it does not make it outright the more superior one. These PC gamers are often grooming console gamers as 12-year-old kids, while they themselves argue that consoles will become as good as PCs when Justin Bieber hits puberty and the PS3 is dying, which is obviously not a valid basis. Some of these arguments that simply state that console gamers are little kids and they should grow up and play PC are just ridiculous beyond belief. It makes me think that they are themselves little kids that are living under a rock or do not want to recognize that the consoles are just a good gaming platform in their own right. I also think they are staining comments pages in YouTube with their caps lock BS and arrogance. I personally love both platforms equally. I think that the consoles have some great games that you simply cannot get on a PC and of course vice versa. My question is, what do you think of this recent wave of arrogant childish PC gamers that cannot fathom the concept of opinion and target markets? And do you think the consoles have as many positives as the PC does? Right, well no, they don't have as many positives as the PC does. This is just a simple fact. A high enough spec PC is more capable than a console in every possible way. And I do mean every possible way. Consoles have literally nothing that a PC cannot do. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. This is not, of course, to say that they haven't in the past and won't in the future, but in its current state, no. A PC is superior to a console in every possible respect, assuming it is a high enough spec. And you can turn around and say, oh, well, it can use Kinect and it can use Wiimote. It's like, this can all be done on a PC as well, so it's fairly irrelevant. A PC is capable, one way or the other, of interfacing with any peripheral device, as opposed to a console, which is not. The idea that the PC is an outright superior platform is also true. It's as simple as that. The PC is capable of higher technical feats than any console on the market. And while every now and again that does change, especially with the release of new hardware, or if the PC is flagging behind at one point, in the current market, there is no console that can match up to my PC, for instance. And my PC is vastly more powerful than the current generation consoles, and hell, you could go even lower on the spec, and it, you would still have a machine that's vastly more powerful. You've got more and more console games coming out right now that are limited to 30 FPS and have very narrow FOV, as well as, of course, no anti-aliasing or anti-tropic filtering of any description, and are sacrificing left, right, and center, and making use of various tricks in order to make the game look reasonable, simply because the current generation of consoles is six years old. Six years! Think about that for a second. Think about the graphics quality back when these consoles came out. The Xbox 360 came out at the end of 2005, and have a look at its launch titles. I mean, Perfect Dark Zero, awful looking game by today's standards. Cameo, which is probably one of the best games in the launch lineup, abysmal looking by today's standards, saved only by the fact that it had a fairly unique graphic style. Whatever the case, those games and indeed the console, they're all technically inferior to what's available on PC right now. So. I would throw the whole fallacy that consoles are just as good as PCs out of the window on a technical level. However, there's a huge difference between being a valid gaming platform and being a technically superior gaming platform. Of course, it's okay to play your games on consoles. I own all the current generation consoles. Why would I not? I'm a gamer, I like to play games. There are plenty of exclusive titles on the console that I cannot get on PC. There is no title that is suited to being played on console as opposed to PC. None. Because in the, at the end of the day, you can adapt a PC to do exactly what a console does. For God's sake, I play all my racing games on PC with a 360 pad. I'm not hardcore enough to bother buying a racing wheel. I don't play enough of them, but 
Now, if I'm going to play a bit of Burnout or maybe Flat Out or Need for Speed or whatever, I will play it on my PC because my PC performs better than my console, but I'll play it with a 360 pad. And there is nothing that you cannot do on a PC that you can do on a console in that regard. It'll keep making the point, oh, well, you can play it on the couch. <laughs> you can play it on the couch with a PC. What's your point? Oh, but the television. Get an HDMI cable that reaches to that. Um, if your PC's in another room, then, of course, that's going to be a problem. But in my case, that's not an issue. Anyway, that's beside the point. It is totally reasonable for people to play games on consoles. Why? Because actually getting a reasonably spec gaming PC is more expensive than buying a console. Every time. You cannot buy a PC for the price of a console that can actually play games of that fidelity. You cannot. The console is the most cost-effective way to game. To suggest otherwise, and to suggest that everyone should buy a high-spec gaming PC is the most ludicrously elitist thing I can think of. And yes, there are some very childish PC gamers that like to get up and say, mm, well, you can't afford a gaming PC. Well, man, I just tossed $3,000 into this fire right here. What, what? Yes, please. Yeah, my gaming PC is expensive. I need it for my job. But at the end of the day, if you're dropping three and a half to $5,000 on hardware, I mean, this PC is about $5,000 machine, then you have to have a lot of disposable income and you have to really have a reason for that. Whereas you can buy a refurbished Xbox 360 from GameStop for $99. $99. That's ridiculously good value. Think about that for a second. And PS3s don't cost that much either. I think, actually, my missus picked one up for 200 as they were doing $100 off because of the whole PSN nonsense. I mean, come on. That is not a lot of money at all. What we're talking about here is diminishing returns. <laughs> Good Lord, $99. So I could either buy one of my graphics cards, 580 GTX, or five Xbox 360s. Gee, I cannot imagine why people game on consoles. It's as simple as that. Console gaming is generally more reliable. Console gaming is easier to set up. Console gaming is certainly cheaper on the initial investment. Now, yes, over the course of several years, you could make a lot of that back if you, say, bought just only during Steam sales on a PC. But then again, you could also make that back on buying used games. Now, console games often depreciate in value at a rapid rate and after a few months end up in the bargain bin for like $40 to $50 cheaper than what they were initially. That said, you're buying used games, which is harmful to the developer and publisher, but still, it, the point stands. This is why people game on consoles. There is nothing inferior about being a console gamer. The platform itself is technically inferior, certainly, but it doesn't somehow make you a worse gamer. And I think, really, this whole PC elitism thing is getting incredibly tiring. It's so incredibly dumb. I mean, really. I think the ironic thing about those who look down the nose at console games and say, well, I can afford a high-spec gaming PC, blah, 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 is they apparently also can't afford to buy the consoles as well because they're missing out on so many really, really great games. Like, well, I just own a PC. Like, yeah, but I own consoles because there's games on console that don't get a PC that I actually want to play. And it's as simple as that. And I'm not willing to wait for the PC version, assuming it even arrives. And sometimes if it does, the port is awful, so there's no point playing it on there. It's expensive to be an Omni gamer, folks, but I'll tell you, it gives you a much, much more balanced perspective on gaming in general. You don't tend to shout at people as much about their choice of gaming machine. This one comes in from Kevin. It says, I've been enjoying video games a great deal ever since I was a kid, and I'm a bit of a gaming elitist. However, in the recent games, I've noticed many games have been dumbing down, especially in RPGs, to the point where actual game mechanics have been exchanged for easier gameplay and understanding, leading to less game depth. More often than not, I feel that this takes away from the overall game experience. For example, the most atrocious violation was in Fable 2, where the fighting mechanics were so simplified that you were pushing one button for magic and one button for physical. To a lesser extent, my gameplay of Final Fantasy was also diminished, as I found you could win by repeatedly pushing auto battle every single encounter, with the occasional paradigm shift thrown into the fray. The fact that there are only two stats in the game, strength and magic, didn't help, and I couldn't help but feel I was confined as to how to build my characters. As you're an avid gamer, I'm sure you've faced this issue before, so I'd like to know your stance on it. Well, it's bad. <laughs> how could it be anything else? Dumbing down those kind of games doesn't help anybody. You want to know why? Because the people you're dumbing down for don't actually appreciate it. We're not making these games casual friendly. It's 
it's stupid. Uh, if we're talking about casual gaming in terms of console gaming and indeed PC gaming, we're talking about PopCap games. We're talking about Zynga. We're talking about things for the Wii. We're talking about Just Dance for Connect and things like that. Those are the casual games. Those are for the people that basically do not game and do not understand what game mechanics are and how the various gamey tropes that we have in our hobby of choice actually work and why they're there in the first place. So the games that we play, like, say, Halo, for instance, or Fable, or Gears of War, or Quake, or anything like that. Those games are designed for gamers. Gamers already understand how to do these things. They do not need to be led by the frickin' nose. And it hurts the gaming experience, the dumber it is. Prime example, Duke Nukem Forever, dumbed down. It's say in Duke 3D or Doom or any of the old school shooters, that's bad because people might get lost. Having key cards to fight, no, that's bad because people might get stuck. Having more than two weapons, absolutely not. People can't handle that kind of thing. We'll just give them the weapons that they need for this particular segment and then you can swap them over for something more appropriate once you get through it. Blah, 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 and infinitum, quick time events and all that nonsense. Yeah. It's horrible. It really, really is and I would strongly urge people not to support those kind of games. I'd actually say Call of Duty is a prime example of this as well. Modern Warfare onwards has just been dumber and dumber and dumber to the point where everything is scripted. You are not trusted to do anything yourself anymore. And I absolutely despise that. And I will hammer any game that I see to be doing that. Dumbing down in mainstream gaming is a stupid idea. Nobody really appreciates it. And I actually think that all of this dumbing down is one of the main reasons why people are swinging very heavily in the direction of playing games for their multiplayer. Why do you think Call of Duty is so popular as a multiplayer title and is a forgettable single player experience, at least past Modern Warfare 2 at any rate? What are you going to do with the Black Ops single player? For God's sake, there was a guy that went through the entire first level without firing his gun even once. It was all scripted. It was so tightly scripted that you were not trusted to do anything yourself. Hell, you ran into an invisible wall if you tried to get ahead of your AI partner. You can't open doors yourself. I think that it's partly dumbing down because they're trying to attract this wider audience, which I might add is stupid and makes no sense. Once they've bought the game, that's it. They're done. Like, oh, I bought this game, but I found it too hard. Tough, you can't return it. So it doesn't make a blind bit of difference. It's not going to matter. I think it's actually more just a sheer lazy design. It really, really is. It's much, much easier to have someone press A to do thing when it pops up a flashy little button on the screen than it is to actually give them control over a situation and a few different ways to do it. So the laziness of gaming just needs to stop. Why is game development taking so long and costing so much money when the options in the game become much, much more limited? If you're going to make a movie, just make a freaking movie, please. Don't fool us into thinking that it's a game, because the mechanics are so dumbed down that you have no real control to begin with. This one comes in from Lucas that says, Hey TB, I've been wondering if you could answer a question I've been asking myself for a long time now regarding video game soundtracks. There's a ton of absolutely fantastic video game soundtracks around, naming Blazblue, Soldner X2, and the Command & Conquer series. There's just a couple of examples out of many. However, I am finding finding, that's a terrible sentence, we'll go with it anyway, I'm finding finding and enjoying them to be difficult. I'll elaborate further. Every video game soundtrack CD that I find that I'm interested in is either incredibly rare or incredibly expensive for what it is. Sometimes the soundtrack is just as expensive, if not more so, than the actual game. A lot of people have just told me to download them, but I'm unsure whether or not that would fall into piracy, and as such would result in possible action being taken against me for downloading them. I've been lucky enough to bump into several special editions and special offers which include the soundtrack of the game, such as Frozen Synapse and Arcana Heart 3 Special Edition, but I feel as if I'm restricted just because developers do not release their soundtrack in an easy to obtain format which is reasonable in pricing. However, I'm also told that you can download and use some soundtracks without fear of consequence or action being taken against you. How is one able to tell whether or not this is the case and what's your opinion on the whole ordeal? Well, technically speaking, downloading anything that is copyright material without permission is illegal. Uh, it, that is piracy. The thing is, piracy is a very dodgy debate because some people view it as a victimless crime, and actually in some cases it is. And for instance, if we were talking about an old game, uh, an old game that had a soundtrack that was not available on sale, or indeed, this is the critical thing to look at. Does the game have a soundtrack that is on sale new? Not used, eh? new. That's the big deal, because if it's new, then yes, 
the artist and probably the game's publisher are going to get some revenue from that. If it's used, they won't see a dime. It's the same principle as old abandonware. Abandonware was, and still is, a term used to describe games that are not readily available on sale anymore, that have be basically been abandoned by the publishers, developers, and distributors. So downloading them is a victimless crime. Since the advent of GOG, this has become less and less, and I'm actually quite glad for that. It's good to be able to support these titles, especially when they are generally updated to work with modern OSs. The chances are, yes, you, you can download a video game soundtrack and get away with it. I've never heard of anyone ever being caught out for that, but that doesn't mean you necessarily should. This is what I believe. I think that developers and publishers are actually missing a fairly ridiculous opportunity in terms of DLC. And this might make people cringe, but hear me out for a second. Why is it that, say, anything released on Steam cannot also have the option to add on the soundtrack as, say, DRM-free MP3s for a couple of extra dollars? I would happily do that, without question. I mean, I have a very large VGM collection, and pretty much all of that has been downloaded. It's as simple as that. I can't get it anywhere else, and it's not hurting anybody, so why not? I'm happy to admit that. And more to the point, I'm actually able to give those artists exposure. I'd like to give an example, actually. One of the currently active artists that you should definitely support is the composer behind the Command & Conquer music. He goes by the name of Frank Klepaki. His website is frankklepaki.com, spelled with K-L-E-P-A-C-K-I.com. Yes, it's in the link in the description below this video, in fact. He did stuff like Hellmarge. I support him by buying his solo work and things like that, and also promoting his music. I think that more developers and, of course, composers should take that into account. Now, I do see some composers actually selling their soundtracks for the price of a normal CD. I don't think, sadly, that people value VGM music as much as they would a proper album. If you're asking the same for that, as say, a CD from a top 10 artist, people are just going to turn their nose about it. They don't view VGM as something that's as good. But I'd like just to point this out. Volume sales are good, too. Especially when you are effectively not paying anything for the reproduction of it. Just make it all download sales. So you say, oh, well, you know, my, my music is worth far more than $2 for the entire album. You're probably right, but you have to charge what the market will bear. If you make that soundtrack $10 plus, you are probably only going to attract hardcore collectors. I'm sorry, this is just the absolute truth of the current state of the market. If you make it $2, that becomes an impulse buy for a lot more people. And you will, in the end, make far more. And you will start building new fans of VGM. Because people are more willing to take the plunge on 2 bucks than they are on 10 this is something I think perhaps Valve should be looking into, and maybe Gamers Gate. GOG already does this to some degree. When they can, they get the soundtracks for the games, and they make them available for free for those who purchase that particular title. I think Steam and Gamers Gate and Director Drive should be talking more to developers and saying, look, we can offer hosting for this. I mean, of course they can. Think about it for a second. You know, a soundtrack for a game is often very little extra download. So Steam wouldn't even notice, but they can charge for it. They can throw a couple of dollars on it and say, would you like to add the soundtrack for $2 in DRM3 MP3s? Hell, you can integrate a player into Steam if you like. I wouldn't use it, but hey, put it there, music player in Steam. And there you go. You've just generated new revenue avenues for both smaller indie development companies and larger ones. Frozen Synapse did it. You could buy a soundtrack edition. I bought the soundtrack edition. I was very happy with that. And hopefully it helped those guys out a little bit as well. I don't see why not. There is some very high quality VGM available these days. And while I buy it when I have the option, more often than not, I don't. And I'm certainly not going to pay top dollar to some used scalp because it's not going to the artist. It's the reason I don't tend to buy used when it comes to games and music. Because, as I said before, I want to support the person that made it, not some random guy that happens to have it lying around his warehouse. Okay, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the mailbox. As I said, I have been away for the past week, so hopefully most of you actually realized that. And those of you who didn't want to watch the StarCraft 2 content, I totally understand. And we'll be seeing more WTF, as well as hopefully some League of Legends content, more mailbox, a bit of bloodlines and things like that coming up in the not-too-distant future. Variety will return to this channel, folks. Thanks for enduring the StarCraft, and hopefully we made a few more fans, because it is a fantastic spectator esport. And I'll see you next time.